Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. And thank you to our friends at El Rio for hosting today's session, The Lung and Short of It, Updates in Pediatric Pulmonology with Dr. Benjamin Nelson. Dr. Nelson is an assistant professor of pediatrics in the Division of Pediatric Pulmonology at Mass General Hospital for Children. He, be, he became associate program director for the Pediatric Pulmonology Pulmon, Pulmonary Fellowship in 2012 before becoming program director in 2015. In addition, he is the director of the pediatric bronoscopy scopy program and the director of continuing medical education in the Department of Pediatrics, where he oversees all CME programs. In addition to his clinical responsibilities, Dr. Nelson has built a career focus on medical education. His areas of focus are evidence-based medicine, training, well-being, recruitment, and workforce issues. And we're very excited to have him uh, present for the naming project. So Dr. Nelson, when you're ready, please begin. All right. Thanks, Kristen, so much for inviting me, and thanks everyone for joining. Uh, forgive me um, for my, vo I'm gonna share my screen here, but um, uh, forgive me for my voice a little bit. Um, I was, uh, let's see, I was just diagnosed, uh, well, I just tested positive for COVID um, after having uh, slight symptoms over the last day or so. I feel fine other than a little fatigue uh, and the hoarse voice. Um, but I am banished up here in my room, uh, but I'm very happy to be talking to all of you today. Uh, so let's go ahead and start here. Uh, I have no disclosures uh, about what we'll be talking about today. Uh, and Kristen mentioned that you are eligible for CME credit. Okay, <laughs> so what I wanted to do here, <clears throat> excuse me, is... <clears throat> start with a little bit of a um, a case uh, to see where we're all at here. <clears throat> Sorry. So this was a 17-year-old girl that came to my clinic. She was referred to me uh, due to shortness of breath. It had been going on for about a year. She's a cross-country runner, and she says to me that she can't get a full breath in or out. She feels that her heart is racing. She complains that she's wheezing and feels tight. She denies cough. She says that for practices, she's pretty much fine and doesn't have any problems. However, a few minutes into races, especially when she's pushing herself, she'll become extremely short of breath and symptomatic. She did have asthma as a child, but she said she outgrew it and hasn't really had any symptoms for a number of years. She's a little bit anxious. Uh, it doesn't take any medications for this. And uh, her mom has exercise-induced bronchoconstriction. So based on this history, I'm curious, go ahead and type in the chat, what do you think is the most likely diagnosis here? Do you think this is a patient with exercise-induced bronchoconstriction? Someone who just has anxiety? Maybe they're deconditioned? Could this be paradoxical vocal, vocal fold motion? Is there a cardiac issue or do you think you need more information to answer? see one brave per, uh, person answering so far. Oh, a couple are coming in. Okay, good. All right. So this is a really common referral that I get. And what we're going to do here is we're going to go through some definitions and terminology. Uh, we'll talk about a differential diagnosis. And then I'll present some cases that I've seen in clinic and what uh, how you should think about them if you saw them in your practice. So terminology, uh, there's different definitions of wheeze. I would say that there's different definitions amongst providers, amongst trainees, especially different uh, between uh, patients. And so be careful when you're asking patients if they're wheezing or if they report that they're wheezing, uh, because it's not always a true wheeze. Wheeze does not equal asthma. And the absence of wheeze does not rule it out. So sometimes it's helpful, sometimes it's not. And always ask yourself when a patient tells you that they're wheezing, is it really strider? And this will become really evident why I'm bringing this up, especially when it comes to exercise issues in teenagers. Teenagers don't know the definition of strider. Uh, most people don't, why would they? Uh, and so any high-pitched sound coming from their airway, they're gonna report as wheeze. <clears throat> 
just uh, so we're on the same page, I tend to use the def the term exercise induced bronchoconstriction rather than exercise induced asthma, mainly because exercise doesn't cause asthma. It's really that in a patient who's predisposed to asthma may be triggered by exercise. And I find it uh, just to be a little bit more um, uh, useful of a way to use it. Timing is key. Uh, so this graph is nice here. So this is the time course of what you should expect when you're thinking about your lung function in patients with exercise-induced bronchoconstriction. So along the x-axis is time after you start exercising, and along the y-axis is the percent change in your FEV1, uh, so your lung function on spirometry. And you can see that within about three, four minutes, you can start to see a drop in your FEV1 but it really isn't until that 10 to 15 minute mark where you get true bronchoconstriction. So if a patient is telling you, like our patient was in this scenario, that they were becoming short of breath within a few minutes of exercise, that's very unlikely that it's gonna be exercise-induced bronchoconstriction. So if you don't have manifestations of asthma and there's no benefit from a pretreatment with a bronchodilator, and you're only affected with certain activities, you gotta start thinking about other things. Before I start, it, it, you know, a lot of times patients will come to me and say they've tried uh, a bronchodilator like albuterol prior to exercise. Well, what you have to ask yourself is, are they using a spacer? I love this picture here. And are they using it correctly? This was a study, gosh, back in 2011 now uh, in pediatrics, uh, but they surveyed 300 patients and really not surprisingly to me, only about 8% uh, used an MDI with spacer correctly. It's amazing the things that people will do. One anecdote that I'll share with you is that I had a family, uh, I asked the family, you know, show me uh, how you use the inhaler and spacer. It's always best to see how they do it. And the family says, well, we can't because our pet dog isn't here. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, this is a little bit odd, but let's go with it. And I say, all right, let's pretend this chair is the dog. What do you mean? And they take out the inhaler, they shake it, they put it in the spacer, and then they spray the dog. The dog was the patient's trigger. The patient has allergy-induced asthma, and the main trigger is the dog, and they were and they were spraying the dog instead of putting the medications into the child's airways. Now, this seems like a little bit ridiculous, and it is a true story, uh, but you are, um, you'd be amazed uh, what kind of things people do. So just by improving their technique alone, you can really make a big difference. So then you, patients may say, well, I, I'm my, my child or my teenager is very coordinated. They don't need a spacer. And this is a real old study now, but the picture still holds. On the right, you can see uh, these are the lungs with um, uh, when using a spacer. And all this white stuff is all the medication getting into the lungs. And it's about twice as much that gets to where it needs to go when you use a spacer versus the left-hand uh, picture where you're not using a spacer. So just by using a spacer and using proper technique, I'm able to uh, help a lot of patients who do have exercise-induced bronchoconstriction. So I always want to review with patients, what are their goals for exercise? Because they're different for every patient. But two things that I really want to stress is we want children to be able to fully participate. So I never want a family to say, I can't do an activity or I can't go out in a certain uh, weather or something like that because of a breathing issue. So you want everyone to be able to participate and you wanna remove any unnecessary restrictions if at all possible. Whenever you get a patient referred to you with, with uh, problems with exercise, asthma is always gonna be at the top of the list of the differential, but it's not the only thing to think about. And we're gonna walk through some of these other potentials here. Uh, Cause you gotta think about airway issues, cardiac issues, restrictive lung disease, uh, and other things as well. And there may be more than one thing going on. Let's think about airway first. So this is where exercise induced vocal cord dysfunction comes into play. It's also called paradoxical vocal fold motion. You'll also see it in the literature described as exercise induced laryngeal obstruction. Uh, the bottom line here is you can see in this picture here in A, uh, the vocal cords are wide open. 
They're kind of like a backwards V and they sit right above your main airway, your trachea. And normally they're wide open. And so when you're breathing, the air goes in and out and there's no problems. But we know that in some patients, when they exercise, especially when they push themselves, a little bit more prevalent in girls than boys, but it happens in both, more prevalent in teenagers, when they're really pushing themselves, a signal will go to the vocal cords telling them to close inappropriately. And this is what you get in, in picture B. And we'll see a video of this a little bit later. And so you can see that the glottal, the glottic opening now is much smaller. And you can imagine that as you're trying to breathe in through that smaller space, it's going to be challenging. It's like breathing through a smaller straw. And this is why you develop strider instead of wheeze, because it's an upper airway obstruction rather than a lower airway obstruction. What about cardiac issues? So uh, to be perfectly transparent, they're rare, but you always got to think about them because it's not something that you want to miss. So these patients will uh, talk about exercise intolerance. Uh, they might be easily fatigued. Uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, this is what you hear in uh, the athletes who uh, unfortunately just have cardiac arrest and die. Uh, very rare, um, especially nowadays when, it's, when it's, people know more about it, um, but it's still out there. And so I always ask patients when they talk about shortness of breath with exercise, I always ask about syncope. I always ask about family history. Uh, I haven't picked up any, which is good, uh, which, well, uh, I don't think I've missed any, um, uh, but I always ask, uh, it's very rare that they'll uh, talk about these things, but if there is a family history of severe cardiac issues, cardiac arrest, if there's syncope or presyncope with the patient, I will have them seen by a cardiologist. Uh, Lyme disease, especially where I'm from in the New England area, uh, can lead to arrhythmias. And uh, some patients will have a long QT. Uh, and so I'm always mindful of medications that, are, that they may or may not be on. Congenital heart disease, usually you'll know about that, but not always. And so I always look at the chart and ask about these things as well. So these are some of the things, if there is a cardiac issue or kind of red flags for me, um, syncope, palpitations, that's a hard one uh, because most pal palpitations are indeed benign. Uh, patients with vocal cord dysfunction will talk about being lightheaded and dizzy. So that's hard to tease out sometimes. Uh, but if they have radiating chest pain, true wheeze, uh, family history uh, with syncope, that's when I start to get a little bit con uh, concerned. Uh, if they have a murmur on exam, I'll refer them, uh, and I'll also just check their uh, extremities uh, to look at their cap refill. Restrictive. I tend to see this a lot, actually. Uh, this is a CT scan here of a patient with a fairly significant pectus excavatum. Uh, the, the re what happens here is that if the pectus is significant enough, it can actually press right up against the heart, as you can see here in this picture. And what it does is it decreases cardiac output. And that is actually one, if not the only, but one of the few reasons why an insurance company might actually pay for repair of a pectus uh, in a pectus surgery. Usually it's just cosmetic. But if you can show that they have decreased cardiac output with exercise, then uh, that could be a medical indication for fixing it. And the way that you would show that is you would actually not be able to see that just on simple lung function testing on spirometry, plasmography, or diffusion capacity. You really need um, a, a cardiopulmonary exercise test in order to really determine what the cardiac output is uh, when it comes to uh, patients with shortness of breath and a, and a pectus. Uh, scoliosis, Gosh, you have to have pretty severe Cobb angle uh, getting on 60, 70 degrees in order to develop shortness of breath. So that's pretty unusual. And sometimes we'll pick up a myopathy. So a subtle neuromuscular issue uh, that can be a uh, reason for patients having shortness of breath with exercise as well. Okay, other. So anxiety, uh, it's real. 
Unfortunately, we see it a lot in patients, especially in teenage patients, and it can manifest as hyperventilation. And that will oftentimes become uh, kind of pronounced in the setting of exercise. And so sometimes uh, these issues or these um, uh, concerns uh, will be anxiety and hyperventilation. And sometimes that can be hard to tease out. And then just physiologic uh, limitations and deconditioning. Uh, it's real uh, and it can lead to shortness of breath. And the key for us as providers is to try to figure out when is it pathologic? Because everyone gets short of breath with exercise, but at what point is it more than what we would expect or abnormal? And this kind of gets into talking to families or talking to patients about what their expectations are. Uh, are they, is this someone who is trying to push themselves to be a D1 athlete? Uh, or is this someone who can't even participate in gym class uh, and anything in between? And so you got to tease that out as well. Okay, so let's move on to some cases here. So these are all patients that I've seen in clinic that were referred to me. So the first one here is an 18-year-old girl. Uh, she was about to start college. So she went to college in midsummer. It was an interesting uh, in the way they had this done. They had college orientation midsummer, but they didn't start until uh, after Labor Day. So she went there and she got extremely short of breath and she was complaining that it was hard to get the air in. She said it was constant, meaning it wasn't just with exercise. She was feeling short of breath all the time. She was able to sleep at night, and for the most part, she was able to participate in day-to-day -day activities, uh, but it was quite uncomfortable for her. When I saw her, physical exam was completely normal, and she had a past medical history of anxiety. However, it wasn't anything that was significant to the point where she was uh, getting counseling or taking medications. It was just something kind of remote in her history. So for her workup, she had already, the beauty about being a subspecialist is oftentimes patients have tried a lot of things before they come to see you. So it makes my job easier. Uh, so she had already tried albuterol and this didn't do much. She had a chest x-ray, she had an EKG, and she had pulmonary function testing. And the chest x-ray and EKG were normal, so I won't show those. But I'm going to show you the uh, pulmonary function testing because I actually repeated them in my office. And so just to walk you through here, if you look down at the flow volume loop in the bottom left, the green loop above the x-axis here is expiration, and the green loop below the x-axis is inspiration. And then the red loop is post-medication, which we'll get to in a second. And so what we're looking for here is whether or not there's any obstruction. That's what we're really looking for in spirometry. And so we look here first, her FEV1 to FEC ratio, meaning how much she blows out in the first second versus how much she blows out total is 82%. So she was able to exhale 82% of her entire breath in the first second. So that's normal. So that is not obstructed. Her FEV1 is 87% predicted based on her age, her height, uh, her sex, and um, her background. And her FEC is 95% predicted. And so just looking at those numbers, you would have said this is normal spirometry. However, if you look at this green loop here, you can see it's kind of flat on the inspiratory loop, which is below the x-axis. And that, although could just be from poor effort, it could also be from an extra thoracic obstruction, such as closure of the vocal cords. And so what I did was I actually gave her ipratropium, and then we repeated the test. And the, what you can see here is that, especially on the inspiratory loop, now you see much more normal of a pattern below the x-axis. And so she was actually responsive to ipratropium, and we'll come back to that in a few minutes. So this next patient was a 15 year old. Uh, she was a cheerleader. That was the the, her sporting activity. 
And she was referred to me and her story was that she would complain of being short of breath. She said that she would wheeze and their coaches would hear her wheeze. She was given albuterol, but this really didn't help her at all. And she, was su she had such a severe presentation that she was actually admitted, uh, call they called 911 from uh, the cheerleading event, from the game that she was at, and they admitted her to the hospital. A few minutes into the routine is when she became symptomatic. And on physical exam, it was actually described that she had an inspiratory and expiratory wheeze, and her SATs actually were briefly in the 80s. She did have a past medical history of asthma, and she currently, um, but she was currently well controlled for the last 10 years, so it wasn't as though she was having continual problems. So with this history and with this presentation, she was actually first given albuterol, she was escalated to receiving continuous albuterol. She was given systemic steroids as well as magnesium. So basically treated as though she was in status asthmaticus. She never had an oxygen requirement. <clears throat> she had that brief desat into the 80s, but that self-resolved. So she never needed supplemental oxygen. And then she was uh, discharged in the morning with a palm referral. So when we saw her at rest, her exam was normal and she had normal PFTs. However, once she started exercising, she developed this kind of central inspiratory wheeze and her PFTs, which are in red here, started to become quite abnormal. And we had her seen in the airway clinic as well um, to uh, look at the vocal cords. And although this isn't her picture, I, found, um, I wanted to demonstrate what you would see endoscopically in this situation. So at rest, totally normal. <clears throat> but this is what happens when she started to exercise. So to orient you, um, we're going through the nose. So this is at the bottom, your epiglottis. Uh, so this anterior is at the bottom of the screen and posterior is at the top. And you can see the vocal cords opening and closing. And now you can see them really kind of um, adducting and, and closing to the point where you can imagine that it's really hard to breathe through that really small opening. It's kind of intermittent here, but that's exactly what you would see. Now, this is really hard to recreate because not all exercise will automatically lead to symptoms in susceptible individuals. You really have to create the exact scenario where they feel stressed or you're pushing them or whatever it might be. And so although it's nice to see that, it's usually not necessary to make the diagnosis. Okay, so now this last patient is a 14-year-old male. He was a hockey player. And he said to me that he, um, his symptoms were cough, throat tightness, as well as chest tightness. They would occur a few minutes into exercise, but sometimes didn't occur until 15 to 20 minutes in. When I saw him, he wasn't exercising, so his exam was normal. And he actually had uncontrolled asthma, which was worse over the last three months. So at baseline, this patient was on low-dose inhaled corticosteroids. He was also on Montelukast. And those were his controllers. And he took albuterol PRN. And this is, let me show you the exercise study that he had. So just look at the pictures here on the bottom. So this is level one at baseline. Uh, again, we have a flow on the y-axis, volume on the x-axis. And above the x-axis is expiration. And below the x-axis is inspiration. And at baseline, his flow volume loop, although maybe a little bit scooped on expiration, looks OK. But then as he starts to exercise, focus first on the expiratory loop, which is above the x-axis. You can see how it's becoming much more scooped as the as he's exercising and then this here this last panel is post albuterol and you can see that it's much better but you can also see below the y-axis 
how especially in level three here how flat level three and level four how flat the inspiratory loop becomes so this patient had evidence of both an extrathoracic obstruction as well as an intrathoracic obstruction so all three of these patients had paradoxical vocal fold motion or exercise induced vocal cord dysfunction or uh, you can call it um, laryngeal um, induced obstruction. Uh, now, th the definition here is that it's episodic. You have inappropriate adduction of the vocal cords during inspiration. And this is key. It leads to dyspnea, but it really is a varying intensity. And we'll walk through some of the most common presentations, uh, but it really is a wide variety of presentations that we tend to see. And believe it or not, it's the most common cause of upper airway obstruction during exercise. Remember, as you know, asthma is a lower airway obstruction. And so the most common upper airway obstruction is going to be vocal cord, uh, vocal cord issues. Prevalence, you know, this is the the really the best data that I could find, uh, but I think it's low, uh, mainly because it's under under reported, and I think a lot of times it's unrecognized. And we'll talk about the fact that it is time limited in the sense that patients oftentimes will get better without any therapy, and so I'm I think a lot of patients have this. It goes unrecognized. Eventually, they get better, but in the literature, you'll see anything anywhere from 5 to 15%. Uh, a lot of patients will have both exercise-induced vocal cord dysfunction and asthma, and we'll talk in the next few slides about how to easily, I think, differentiate between the two. The median age is 14. I've probably seen it down to 9 or 10, uh, but I would say it's most common in teenagers. There's a predominance of females, uh, but again, males are affected uh, as well. And competitive athletes, I really find that uh, some of the things that uh, will trigger patients are when they're really striving to get to that top echelon, or I always ask them, did something change in your sporting activities? In other words, I'll oftentimes hear, oh, I just joined a travel team, or I just am joining the high school varsity team or um, a new competitive team. Uh, oftentimes a change like that can be enough to trigger these events. Why does it happen? We don't know. Unfortunately, we're not smart enough yet to know. However, there's a hypothesis and anecdotal reports um, about this being mediated via cholinergic pathway. Uh, there are clinical trials ongoing, but no data as of yet, uh, and that's important when we talk about therapies down, uh, down the line here. And I really want to stress that there's different phenotypes here. Uh, there's patients who are mild, there are patients who are severe, there are patients who have symptoms at rest, there are patients who have problems with exercise. Uh, some uh, become so severe, although rare, they end up in the hospital and admitted, uh, but most of the time that's not the case. Okay, this is the uh, slide where uh, I want you guys to focus on how really I differentiate between the two. And let's really focus on exercise issues uh, for right now. So these are the things that I routinely will ask patients uh, to try to differentiate what's going on. So when are they having their symptoms? And oftentimes they talk about exercise because that's the most troubling, but always ask if they're having the same symptoms at rest. Because if they're having the same symptoms at rest, by definition, you know you're dealing with something that, although there might be as in the background, there's something else going on as well. I always talk about timing. It's pretty consistent here that asthma, true exercise-induced bronchoconstriction, really doesn't take hold until about 10 to 15 minutes into exercise. And so if you have a patient telling you that they become short of breath within the first two minutes, maybe the first five minutes, it's it's it could be vocal cord issues, could also be deconditioning, it could also be anxiety, but it's really less likely that it's going to be asthma. The other thing you're going to want to tease out 
is what type of exercise, because oftentimes just jogging a warm up lap isn't going to be sufficient enough to cause issues. It's really not until they start doing more intense um, uh, exercise that they have problems. Okay, what is the location? So as we talked about at, for exercise induced bronchoconstriction, it's an intrathoracic issue, which means you're gonna have problems on expiration, which means you'll wheeze. Whereas vocal cords, they're extra thoracic. And so you're gonna have problems on inspiration and you're going to have strider. And so I actually make the sounds for the patient in clinic because they'll say to me, I wheeze all the time. And I'll say, and then I'll say, oh, is it a loud pitch sound when you're breathing in? And I'll demonstrate for them and they'll say, yup, that's exactly what it is. So they'll say it's wheeze when it's really strider. They'll complain of tightness. And I always try to press them as to where the tightness occurs. They might say their chest, and that could be the case if they have exercise-induced bronchoconstriction. But oftentimes they'll tell you, I can't get the air in. It feels like it's getting stuck somewhere. <clears throat> Excuse me. And oftentimes they'll point to their throat. Uh, speaking of cough, it is almost invariably there with exercise-induced bronchoconstriction. I really can't remember a case where I've seen a patient with asthma whose trigger is exercise, who doesn't either cough during exercise or immediately right afterwards. Whereas patients with vocal cord dysfunction, they really won't cough. And so they'll say, no, I don't really cough at all. And so that's another kind of clue to look in for. Uh, with asthma, once you stop exercising, the symptoms should go away. With vocal cord dysfunction, it could also go away right away, but I've had patients describe lasting symptoms uh, for uh, minutes up to even hours after they uh, stop exercising. And then obviously asthma is going to be responsive to bronchodilators, whereas vocal cord dysfunction, and when I mean bronchodilator, I mean uh, something like an albuterol, whereas in vocal cord dysfunction, you won't get that type of response. So oftentimes they'll come to me and they'll say, you know, I get short of breath. It happens a few minutes into exercise. It's hard to get the air in. I've got throat tightness. There's strider. They might complain of heart racing, or they might say some palpitations at times. Some patients will say they get dizzy. Uh, they'll oftentimes tell me that they've tried albuterol already. Obviously, I check to see if they've used a spacer uh, and done it correctly, uh, and they'll be unresponsive. And so those are the triggers. Uh, or the signs and symptoms to look out for. And just on history alone, you can usually make this diagnosis. Other workup, uh, it's oftentimes not necessary to do other workup. You can, and sometimes you need to, because some patients just don't respond the classic way, uh, but you don't need to. So things that you might see, uh, you might think about chest X-ray and EKG, uh, depending on what is on your differential, but I don't think you need to get those exam uh, examinations every time you're thinking about this. And then PFTs at rest or even with exercise. Now, a normal spirometry in that you see in A does not rule out vocal cord dysfunction. If you do see it, that's great like in B where you can see the flattening of the inspiratory loop, but a normal spirometry does not rule it out. Now, you can technically, like we showed in the video, get a patient to exercise, excuse me, get a patient to exercise, recreate the exact scenario, have their vocal cords adduct, stick a tube in their nose, and see that their vocal cords are abnormally adducting. But I can tell you, uh, this will come as no shock, most teenagers won't let you do that. And I would argue it's really not necessary in order to make the diagnosis. It gives you really cool pictures, but you really don't need it. Okay, so treatment. So first and foremost, reassure them. Tell them that, hey, there's nothing going on with your airways. There's nothing going on with your lungs. There's nothing going on with your heart here. That sometimes in and of itself 
can go a really long way. Some patients will respond to anticholinergics. So that would be ipratropium. And so this comes back to the thought that we think that the uh, etiology here, the pathophysiology is that there's an abnormal signal mediated by cholinergic pathways that goes to the vocal cords, telling them to close inappropriately. And therefore, taking an anticholinergic such as ipratropium about 10 to 15 minutes prior to exercise can sometimes be beneficial. And I say sometimes because for some patients it works, some patients it doesn't work. The challenge that I find in um, around here anyways, is that a lot of insurance companies frustratingly won't cover ipratropium because technically the FDA indication for it is for COPD, um, which, is, which is hard. And I see, I see a question here about ipratropium MDI, There's, they're very expensive. Um, I, I totally agree with you. And so what I tell families is that if we can't get it covered or if it's too expensive, it's not worth it to pay out of pocket for it because uh, there's no guarantee it will work. And sometimes there are alternatives that we can try. Uh, so one alternative that we can try, there's a medication now uh, that comes in a Respimat that has albuterol and ipratropium uh, in the same inhaler. Uh, and the, uh, forgive me for the trade name, it's Combavent. I don't recall, I don't, I don't, I think that I don't even know the generic other than albuterol and ipratropium. Uh, but some, a lot of insurance companies will cover that because it has the albuterol in it. And so you can do that. Um, sometimes you're giving them albuterol when they don't need it, but it's probably not that big of a deal. Uh, and so what you do there is I tell them to take either one or two puffs about 10 to 15 minutes prior to exercise. And again, if symptomatic and for the rest of mat, if you're not familiar with it, uh, it's actually just a mouthpiece on the end of it. And so you don't need to use a spacer with it, uh, which a lot of teenagers like nebulized, uh, ipratropium, you can get that, but logistically you can't really be lugging a neb machine around with you when you go to exercise. So that's really not, uh, something that's doable. Uh, and then the other options that I'm not convinced do much are, uh, teatropium, which is a 24 hour acting anticholinergic it's indication, it's, it, it originally was in the COPD literature, but now there's an indication down to six years of age to use teatropium as an add-on maintenance medication for children who have uncontrolled asthma. Um, I've tried it uh, with patients with vocal cord issues, and, I, and really I haven't had a lot of success there. Uh, and so I try to get them either the ipratropium and MDI or the comb event. And if we're unsuccessful, then we just, we, we just move on. Uh, because like I said, for some patients, it's helpful and some patients it's not. And there's no way to predict beforehand. Um, IMT, that's inspiratory muscle strength training. So just like if you were doing bicep curls the, to make your bicep stronger, and then you would subsequently be able to lift things without expending as much energy, it's the same principle. There's commercially available devices. I can't write scripts for them, but there's commercially available devices. They're pretty reasonable in cost. They're handheld, and you breathe in against varying degrees of resistance. And so you're basically lifting weights for your inspiratory muscles. And so that way you can imagine if your muscles are stronger, when you need to overcome this vocal cord adduction, so this upper airway obstruction, your muscles don't have to work as hard and you don't feel as short of breath. So that can be helpful. And then the really the gold standard in the literature is speech therapy. So this would have to be from uh, someone who is trained in dealing with exercise induced vocal cord issues. And what they do is they teach you different mechanisms of how to breathe and open up your airway. So not all speech therapists are trained in doing this, uh, but it really can be um, beneficial. Um, so I, uh, 
I do tend to give the ipotropium before exercise uh, if, um, if we know that exercise is a trigger. So I'll tell them to take it about 15 minutes prior, but then I'll tell them they can take it again once more if they become symptomatic. And usually then they're able to tell whether or not it's working. For some patients, uh, you do have to involve psych because there can be a significant anxiety or psych uh, mental health issue uh, that goes into this. And so sometimes you wanna tease that out. Um, for me, oftentimes I'll talk to families about it. And if there is a real concern, I'll oftentimes bring in their primary care provider who oftentimes knows the family better than I do. Uh, but sometimes you have to have psych involved as well. So what are the outcomes for these patients? There really isn't that much in the literature, believe it or not. Uh, this is a study, gosh, now from 2011. It's a group that I work with um, uh, out of the Mass Eye and Ear in Boston. It's really the biggest study that I'm familiar with. Uh, and they looked at 60 children uh, who are mainly teenagers. And the interesting things here is that overall treatment success, about 75%. And almost everyone after two years after making the diagnosis, their symptoms will resolve spontaneously. And so I tell families, it's not a forever issue. It will eventually go away. Even if we do nothing, it'll go away. But the goal obviously is to have it resolve as soon as possible, because remember the goal here is full participation. And so speech therapy is found to be extremely helpful. Um, uh, so the combination of reassurance, uh, medication, um, if you can get it covered, and speech therapy are the mainstays. Um, the, uh, I'll also oftentimes take patients off medications because a lot of times they'll come to me on uh, inhaled corticosteroids and other medications used to treat exercise-induced bronchoconstriction when it's really not necessary. And then I always tell patients, you got to listen to your body. And when you notice that yourself uh, feeling short of breath, just back off a little bit and slow down a little bit. Uh, that way you can still participate at a high level, but you don't reach that threshold uh, where you become uh, so short of breath that you can't participate. And I think that was it for my slides. I wanted to leave uh, plenty of time. I'm happy to answer questions about anything. Thank you, Dr. Nelson. Just a reminder, uh, you can put your questions in the Q&A box or the chat box or use the raise hand feature. I um, always recommend that option uh, to speak directly with Dr. Nelson when um, asking about medications. I will mess up those names. Uh, and, uh, oh, oh, and Kristen, I would also just say I have my email address here. And so uh, please feel free to email me uh, at any time. Thank you, that's very kind. Um, let me just see. I I'm not sure if you got to this question, but oh goodness, there's a medication. Do you give the ipetropium before exercise or only after onset of symptoms during exercise or does it particularly matter? Yeah, we talked about that a, a little bit. It definitely have to, has to be before, the, at, before exercise. Uh, and then the hope is that it prevents symptoms. Um. Somebody just asked if you could put the slide on asthma versus fo focal fold dysfunction back up for a minute. There's an sure. e and an F word right next to each other. I kept switching the, the sounds. And I think they'll all have access to the slides. Is that right? Yes, absolutely. They'll they'll be emailed tomorrow from <laughs> Zoom. Um, question: Have you seen an increase incidence in exercise induced? bronchial constriction since COVID? If so, why do you think that is? Since COVID, um, you know, I haven't been, I don't think I could say that I'm seeing an increased incidence in exercise induced bronchoconstriction since COVID. However, what's interesting is I have, uh, so I think there's a couple of things going on. One is I think that we're coming out of it now but especially when teenagers were first starting to do activities again, they were all out of shape. And so everything seemed like they had significant uh, symptoms because they couldn't participate like they used to. That was some of it. Um, I think that we're seeing more spread of viral disease, uh, <laughs> my cold included. Uh, and so we're seeing more symptoms in general. Um, but then what's really interesting, <laughs> bless me, excuse me, 
what we're seeing and um, we're at, my group is actually collecting some data on this and hoping to write it up is that we've ah, sorry excuse me we've noticed uh, a lot of otherwise healthy people getting COVID and then developing shortness of breath subsequently. And what we found on exercise studies is that, so normally when people exercise, they raise their systolic blood pressure in order to get all the blood to the rest of the body in an efficient, uh, quick manner. What we found is that patient systolic blood pressure post COVID tends to rise more slowly. And so they become short of breath with exercise. Uh, we've seen that this gets better with time <clears throat> and it's really just treating kind of, you know, filling up the uh, preload. So with hydration and electrolytes and, 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 and the like, uh, but it's a really fascinating thing that we went back and we never really saw it pre COVID. And so there really does seem to be a correlation with COVID and problems with exercise in some patients, not all. Uh, so if you see that, uh, and it doesn't fit with asthma, doesn't fit with vocal cord dysfunction. Uh, it's not someone who's deconditioned. Uh, sometimes we'll do cardiopulmonary exercise testing and we'll see uh, that their um, systolic blood pressure doesn't go up as we would expect. Unfortunately, we don't have much of a treatment, uh, but it can help um, to alleviate their concerns. Um, would you be able to point this in the journal in which the study is published in? Uh, which study are we talking about? The one, um, is it this one here? Um, I'm gonna wait for them to type in, Crystal. Yeah. The one regarding oh. blood pressures. Yeah, so we're actually collecting uh, this data right now, Crystal, uh, in our group. And so we haven't published it yet. Uh, so unfortunately we'll have to wait for the journal for that one. <laughs> Looking forward to reading it. <laughs> Good. Um, I'm just waiting to see if any other questions come in. I don't see any right now. Does not mean that there aren't any. Um, oh, I see that um, Jill typed in, let us know about what kinds of pediatric pulmonary cases I'm seeing in clinic uh, right now. Um, so uh, what's really, it's, it's fascinating that um, not uh, that for two years, uh, you know, there was so there was such little spread of viral illness amongst kids, and there was such little in the way of pulmonary disease. Uh, and now that kids are back in school and not wearing masks like they were, we're not only seeing more spread of viral illness, but the viral illness that's spreading is more, um, the morbidity is much higher. And so we are seeing uh, usual things, but in unusual times of year. So the RSV season was uh, started much earlier and is much more prolonged. We're seeing, uh, what's interesting is not only are we seeing a lot of influenza and it's influenza A is what we're seeing. We're not only seeing a lot of influenza where we really haven't seen any the last couple of years is that we're seeing a lot of uh, sequelae from influenza infections. We're seeing a lot of bacterial super infections leading to either complicated pneumonias or pulmonary abscesses. We've had a number of those, and these are in patients who are vaccinated. Uh, we're seeing um, a lot of asthma, uh, mainly because uh, patients were staying, uh, were avoiding triggers uh, for such a long period of time. So we're seeing a lot of that. Uh, we're fortunately not seeing um, a lot of severe COVID related respiratory issues, um, definitely not in patients who are vaccinated. Uh, so luckily, we're not seeing a lot there. Uh, but I would say we're seeing the usual stuff, but the usual stuff that we're seeing is different times a year and actually more severe. Great. Very, very helpful. All right. So I still don't see any questions. Um, I have seen a number of awesome talk thank yous and thank you for <laughs> being a trooper. Um, if you do have questions for Dr. Nelson, he did share his email, which will also be in the slide deck tomorrow. Um, I know Dr. Nelson's not on our VC platform, but our other pulmonologists are. If you ever get stuck on a case, you can always submit a consult that way. But um, as I don't see any other questions, I think we'll wrap it up and have a 
a good night. But Dr. Nelson, thank you so much for presenting. This was really great. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me. And we hope you feel better. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Have a good night, everyone.